Thank you, my name is Lucas Wilson. Um, I run a company, I founded a company called Supersphere VRAR about um, two, two and a half years ago. We have offices in Los Angeles, New York, and Singapore. And for about the past two, two and a half years, we've been doing nothing but VR and AR, um, which in this industry makes me an old timer. Um, so I thought, you know, I, this is a presentation I've given a few times, and it, I think it's helpful to, to take people through what I call all the R's. It seems like that there's MR, AR, VR, QR, there's, there's, there's tons of R's. And there's a lot of confusion in the industry about what is what um, and what all those R's mean. And so I, it's useful, I think, for people to get a grounding in some, in some of that and sort of the shifting sands of what that means. So I'll start it off with, and you're gonna have to excuse me, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly sick and I've dosed myself up with like 19 Alka-Seltzer pluses and three vitamin C's, so if I seem a little loopy, it's because I am. Um, so I like to start it off with, uh, with this, which hopefully, which will date me a little bit, but judging by, judging by the hair color I see in some of the audience, most of you have prob probably remember this campaign. Look at me. Do you like what you see? Good. Because it's not me. It's a recording of me on new Memorex videotape. This remarkable tape has been recorded and re-recorded 100 times, but I bet you still couldn't tell if it was Memorex or me which really isn't me. It's Memorex, new Memorex videotape. Even after 100 recordings, you'll wonder, is it live or is it Memorex? Thank you very much, thank you, thank you. Had to dig deep, dig deep into a strange corner of YouTube to find that. Um, but I think that's, you know, I see that ad, and that ad keeps coming back to me because it seems like no matter how far we go with every new shiny object that comes around in the entertainment industry, we're always after the quest for reality. We're always after the quest to, to reproduce in some way, shape, or form what we see with our own two eyes and hear with our ears. And whether that's done through, you know, throughout, from the dawn of history, whether that's done through through paper, through papyrus, to paper, to skipping several generations, to black and white TV, to color TV, to HD, to 4K, to da 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 It's always about a more accurate recreation um, of what's in front of us, or a more accurate recreation of a completely alien world. So it always, it always strikes me that that Memorex ad is, is all about, to, to me I see that, and it's, it's very real, it's very much what virtual reality is, is, is sort of what are you looking at and, and what are you seeing and how are you presenting it. And this sort of hit home for me about a year and a half ago, I was asked um, uh, by the White House and by the Verge Media, by Verge Media to come to do, handle the production and the post-production pipeline for the very first VR um, recording of, at that time, the First Lady, the ex-First Lady in the White House of, of Michelle Obama. And it was 11 minutes of the First Lady, her social media director, and the editor-in-chief of Verge Media sitting there talking to each other. And you ask yourself, why in the world would you shoot that in 360 or VR? Why would you, why? And as a show of hands, um, I can't really see your hands, but I'll ask anyway. As a show of hands, how many people in the audience think that VR is sort of, is sort of in some ways the latest passing fad or the latest passing craze? It's okay if you do. All right, I actually, I, I see one or two hands, but okay. So, uh, you know where the door is, no. <laughs> this, is, this is why, this is why I, I don't think this is the case. So, 11 minutes of the first lady sitting there talking to her social media director and one other person. As we were doing the post-production for this, something sort of struck me. Um, is that when this is done, when the piece is done, it's a nice piece, the first lady is incredibly eloquent, it was a good interview, um, and when it's done, if you look at it in a 16 by nine frame, you're looking at it on your TV screen or on your computer, and the area around it is still your living room or your dining room or your kitchen, it's still the, your reality. The difference when you put on a headset or the difference when you see it in a 360 or a VR environment is the difference between being between looking at the White House and being in the White House. And that's a qualitative difference because immersion matters. When you are in an environment, when you surround your audience in an environment, it matters. It doesn't matter whether that's, whether that's something that really takes what we call full use of the 360 degree space, whether it's interactive, whatever. It matters, just the, just the point of being put into another world so that your peripheral vision and the, your audio is in that world, it matters. 
human beings are wired to perceive what's around them. And if most of what's around you, except for that little tiny screen in front of you, is your reality, you're not going to have as deeper a connection to your subject material as you would if you're immersed. And this is something that I, that I say a lot, that I strongly believe, is immersion equals emotion equals engagement. When you immerse somebody in a 360 degree world, whatever that world is, you are increasing their emotional attachment to that world. When you are increasing their emotional attachment to that world, you're engaging them. And you're engaging them, whatever your call to action is, whether your call to action is to just finish watching the video, or whether your call to action is to buy something, or be moved, or go to a website, or whatever you want your audience to get, whatever you want to communicate, by immersing them, you're going to increase the chances that you're going to be successful with that communication. I gave, I gave a similar presentation to this last week in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, and in Lincoln, Nebraska, as statistics show, your, the opinion of, of the first family that was just in the White House is different than it, than it is for the demographic profile of the West Side, typically. And I made the point of whatever your emotional attachment is to the first family, it's going to be increased and augmented by being immersed in that environment. If you don't like them, you're not going to like them even more. If you like them, you're going to like them even more. It's a really, really important piece of information. And, excuse me, this is also backed up by, by a lot of data, which I'll get into in a minute. All right, so getting ahead of myself. So let's step through sort of the different degrees of what is 360 video and what all the R's are. So let's start with 360 video. And there's a bit of a religious discussion in the community over what is 360 video and what is VR. It's, it's clarifying significantly, but let's just step through 360 video. And out of curiosity, how many people here have done an active, have done a VR production of any kind? Okay, so this may be old news to some of you, um, and if it is, just throw stuff at me and I'll move on. Um, but this is what 360 video looks like when it's projected on a flat plane. Now, when you look at 360 video in a player, you're just looking at it in a player. It's like Flash or HTML or Uyala or Brightcove. It's a player, except it's a player that's designed to look at 360, vi 360 degree video and designed to be able to interpret your motions and what you're looking at. So this is actually a geometry. It may look weird, but it's a geometry you're used to. You just may not realize that you're used to it. I'm almost tall enough to do this. Ah, yeah. All right. Um, it's a Mercator projection. It's actually not. If there are any math nerds in here, they'll beat me with sticks. It's actually an echo rectangular pro projection, which is different from a Mercator projection in a way that I'm not familiar with, but people get angry at me when I say it's a Mercator projection. It's not, but it's close enough. Um, and everybody's used to this geometry. It's a globe pressed flat. You take a globe, you, you press it out, and your south pole is stretched and your north pole is stretched. And, it, and it's designed to meet at the edges and pinch into a globe. And that's exactly what this is. If you look at that, that's um, a piece we did for, for David Chang and the Momofuku brand. And this is his Momofuku restaurant, uh, the Daiko restaurant in Toronto. So the bottom is stretched, the top is stretched, and it's designed to wrap into a circle, pinch, and then you can look around at it. Now, it's also important to realize that when someone's in a headset or when someone's in a player and looking at it, that, that's about the field of view they get. That's about, the average, that's about the average iPhone or Samsung phone field of view for a 360 video. So it's very important in any kind of production or any kind of post when you're staging these shots or when you're posting these shots to keep that in mind of what your audience is looking at. And I get into this discussion probably once a week with a director or a DP that gets agitated about VR and gets agitated about 360 about, well, what's my job now? What, what you know? You know, you're taking my job away and I, they're just recording the environment and I can't tell people what to look at, and that's garbage. Um, the, the role of the director and the DP has not changed. It is still to guide the eye and to tell a story. Um, when you're looking at a 16 by 9 screen, you're focusing on a specific part of the screen and you're focusing on that part of the screen because there are a world of creative cues that the team that composed that shot has made in order to tell you where to look and what to look at. The same thing is true of 360 video. And I've seen probably thousands of people um, put on 360 headsets. And I come with props. Um, and here's what happens every time somebody puts on a 360 headset. You guys have all seen this if you watch people looking. Here's what happens every single time. Right? 
for the first about five or 10 seconds that, someone's put, that someone looks at a piece of 360, that's what happens. Here's what happens after about 10 seconds. That's what happens. And the reason that happens is because human beings are physiologically, and are physically and mentally wired to focus. You don't have a swivel head for a reason. You can only look around so much because human beings are wired to focus. And focus is what directors and DPs do with their, with their creative talents. You know, I've, I've watched hundreds, thousands of people look at stuff. And the way people look at stuff is like this. You're looking at something. Something over here calls your attention. The first thing that happens is you swivel your head to look at that object. Then your brain makes a determination. Is this, is this something I should be focusing on? If it is, then your shoulders shift, and now that's your new point of focus. That's how people look at stuff. And that's how VR, that's how 360 video, that's how VR happens. If there's something happening behind you that you're not supposed to be looking at, here's what people will do. They'll look back there and they'll go, that's boring. And then they'll turn back around and look at what you want them to look at. So when you're composing a 360 frame also, these sort of lines help to help at least, I, I create these guidelines for editors and post because it helps to understand that the line on your, on your, I just do this, the line on your left, that's nine o'clock, the line on your right is three o'clock, and the edges are directly behind your head. Um, and, and always keeping in mind that the field of view that's in the middle, that's what people are looking at. So when you're looking at this frame in an editing platform, you may put something over here, and you may think, oh, people are gonna see that. But it's outside of their field of view, they're not gonna see it. So you have to be very careful in how you're composing and how you're editing shots. So that leads me to talk a little bit about audio. So, I won't go into too much gory detail on 360 audio. Um, there's a bunch of different formats out there, Dolby Atmos, Ambisonic First Order, Ambisonic Higher Order, Sennheiser has one. There's, there's all sorts of immersive audio formats out there. The important thing to realize about audio is that it allows you, audio in a 360 world or in a VR world, allows you to do something you cannot do with any other medium. You can cue all around you. You can create a 360 degree audio universe. You can put sounds behind people. You can put sounds above people. And you can cue them to look that way. And when you do that, you can do sort of little magic tricks. Um, remembering that the field of view that people have and what they're looking at and what they're not looking at. One of the first um, experiments I did in 360 was did a band and put a, you know, recorded a band in, in their rehearsal space. And it starts off with you're looking at the band in the rehearsal space, and you get bored after a minute or two. And then there's a crash behind you. Your limbic system, if there's a loud crash behind you, your limbic system does not allow you to not whip your head around. Everybody whips their head around. So you whip your head around to look. And the drummer dropped a cymbal, and it's like, oh, okay, fine. But while, you're, while you've whipped your head around to look, something happens here, and there's a noise here, and you turn your head back around, and now you're on stage at Madison Square Garden. So because of that field of view, you can, you, and through the use, clever use of audio and through the clever use of other techniques or tricks, depending on what word you want to use, you can make creative use of that space and you can do all sorts of interesting things in that space that you can't do in any other format. And it's also important to remember that in 360, you don't always have to show 360. You can, you can, it's a palette that you can put all sorts of different elements in, whether they're standard HD or 2D or what have you. Um, did a piece a while ago for the, for the Minnesota Twins, which we did a trick. Everybody's seen this trick, but we did it in 360, and it's really powerful, where somebody's holding up the old photograph of 50 years ago in a location, and it's geo-matched to what's behind you, and then you remove the photograph, and you see the, the space as it is today. We did that in 360, where it started off with a 2D picture, an archive picture, and then it faded away as the current, as the current um, environment faded in. And that was the first time in the piece that you went from historical 2D to full 360, and it's, it's a real impact. Um, ambisonics, that, that one on your left, uh, basically ambisonics break down into WXYZ. It's a wave file, it's four channels in a wave file. W is omni, so it's everything around you. X, Y, and Z are Cartesian coordinates, X, Y, Z. And in Pro Tools and Ableton and various, in the popular audio tools, there are plugins that allow you to mix in WXYZ and allow you to output in a 360 audio format. And again, that's simplifying it a bit. There's Dolby Atmos, there's a bunch of things. But the important point is that you can create a 360 audio world and mix and deliver in that world. And 
this is just useful for me. Another thing that I do for audio is that this sort of rough is roughly analogous to a 5.1 world. That center, left, right, left surround, and right surround. And that's sort of vaguely where they are on the spectrum if you mix in a 5.1 world. So now let's get into the religious discussion of um, 360 versus VR and what is what. And in my mind, and this is a, a slightly religious argument, but the line between 360 and VR is, is, um, is, user, is user action, right? Is, is user engagement. If as a user, you can push into the content and the content responds to your action and does something different based on your action and you change the course of content, that's VR when you're in, a, when you're in, in an immersed world. Um, if you think of entertainment as sort of on a spectrum from fully passive to fully active, with fully passive being a movie theater. You go into a movie theater, you sit there, the content happens to you, right? Fully active is like a first person shooter, like Call of Duty or something like that. It sits there until you happen to it. You have to do something and the content changes. A lot of the most successful VR experiences I think are in this gray area in between, which uses traditional tools from passive linear storytelling and traditional tools from the gaming world and fuses those into something new that people really haven't quite defined yet. Um, this one thing that we did, gosh, a while ago, we did uh, for a studio, they wanted, there was a film coming out and they wanted a VR experience in a swamp. Okay, sure. So we did this test uh, where we had a really talented artist build a 360 pano of a swamp using a combination of 3D tools and stock photography. And it was pretty. And you look around, it's like, okay, you're in a swamp. And then we did, we, we just did one thing. We took that same still frame, we put it into a game engine, and we added a point source light. So we added, we added where the sun is in that still frame, we put a game engine light there so it was reactive. And then we also put um, fog around, interactive fog around, so that when you moved your head, the fog swirled, and it moved with you, and the light interacted with the fog. Keep in mind, it was the same background, same video. Only those two active elements were added. And I did my own very unscientific test, and probably 30 or 40 people at the studio um, saw, and we showed them the two different pieces and didn't tell them anything was different. The average amount of time that people stayed in the headset that was just the still frame, was about five or six seconds. The average amount of time that they spent in the headset with the same still frame, with the only thing added is those two interactive elements, was about 28, 29 seconds. Interaction increases engagement a tremendous amount. So anything that you can do to increase engagement is a big deal. On the delivery side, though, as soon as you step into that world, you're stepping from delivering a three. You're stepping from delivering a video to delivering an app, um, in dealing with the in dealing with the the trials and tribulations that that go with delivering an app. This is just an example of a project we did a while ago for Directv. Um, that was that was for a sport called BKB. Um, it's basically boxing rules on a sumo pitch. It's kind of cool to watch. But we went to, we went to Mandalay Bay and recorded, did a very high resolution VR recording of this. Um, and then we put that into a game engine. And everywhere that you see BKB was replaced with ad server from an ad server. Those two things above the boxers were not there. We inserted those and those became interactive elements. The video screens on the left and right had gaze interactions. So when you looked at them, they moved towards you and there was, fo there was fog and smoke and fireworks and all sorts of things. And the, amount, the average amount of time people stayed in that experience was increased dramatically just by the addition of interactive elements because they were playing a game, but they just didn't know it. So now, AR, augmented reality. AR has been around for forever. Um, and it's gotten a new fancy sheen on it, but it's been around for forever. All that AR is, is superimposing data of some kind, superimposing real-time data of some kind onto an image that's in the background. That, at its basic level, that's, that's all it is. Probably the most famous example that everybody's aware of is avionics, right? Heads-up displays and avionics, this is AR. It's, it's a different AR from many, many years ago and many, many moons ago, but that's AR. It's layering, data, it's layering data of some kind on top of a real-time streaming background of some kind. That's AR from, from times gone past. When people think AR these days, this is more what they think, right? But it's the same concept. It's taking data and layering data, um, layering real-time data from somewhere on top of a background and having that data interact with the background in some way, shape, or form. Where is Posh Bagel? 
I still don't know. I grabbed that picture from somewhere. I still don't know where it is. Um, so that's, that's AR, okay? Then we get into MR, mixed reality, which is a subset of AR. But mixed reality is basically creating a digital environment and having that, creating, you have the digital environment, you have your real world environment, and it's making those two environments interact in, in, a, in such a way that it creates a new mixed environment from the digital environment and the real environment. Um, one of the best, clearest examples I can think of for this is, is the lava pit. How many of you have tried on a Microsoft HoloLens? All right, for those of you that haven't tried on a HoloLens, it's, you know, it's a big, bulky, geeky looking headset. First thing that you do when you put on a HoloLens is you push a button, you spin in a circle. And in the time that you spin in the circle, the HoloLens has mapped your room, has mapped the environment, has created a 3D live 3D mesh of your room. Then the demo that typically people go through when they first put on a HoloLens is you push a button and you're in a game all of a sudden. You push a button, you don't know what's going to happen and a crack appears in the ceiling and an alien comes through that crack and all of a sudden there are aliens in the room and it looks like it, it looks like the ceiling is opening up and there are aliens streaming in. It's, it's, it's not a happy feeling, honestly. Um, so, but that's, that's a mixed reality. It's creating a digital environment, superimposing it on top of, on top of a real environment. This is an app um, made by a team in downtown LA that I've worked with a lot, a team called Magnopus. Um, they have a, a very talented developer, a woman named Sally Slade, who um, is an, the rare blend of a, a talented, fine artist and a talented programmer. It's a pretty unusual bird. Um, and she created this app, which is the every five-year-old's five game. It's the lava pit in the living room, right? You push a button, and after you've mapped your room, you push a button, and lava starts coming up from the ground. And you have to do what five-year-olds do. You have to jump around on different objects and avoid the lava pit, right? And you've never seen something as silly as, as guys that look like me with the HoloLens headsets on in, in Magnobus's lobby jumping around like this. In, in thin air, like three or four of them jumping around. It's fantastic. But that's a good example of mixed reality and what mixed reality does. Um, Magnopus also, how many, of you, how many of you saw the ISS space station app from Oculus that came out last week? Magnopus was the company that did that. Um, obviously working with NASA in close collaboration, but they're the company that created that entire experience as well. Really talented group of guys and girls. Um, so that's mixed reality. So that's 360 video, VR, AR, MR, and, you know, and that gets back around. All those R's and all those different things get back around to the basic concept of immersion matters, right? When, when, you, when you put people in an environment, you engage them in that environment in a bunch of different ways. And there's two things, you know, that I, that I end with. One thing is that, they don't have a slide for this yet, but I'll just talk it through. Um, we did a... Uh, Last two weeks ago, uh, my company produced the, um, the 360 live stream for the red carpet for Disney's Beauty and the Beast. Um, and it was, sort of a ground, it was sort of a groundbreaking moment for Facebook 360 and for, and for Disney for a couple of reasons. Number one is that it had, um, it was the, for a Facebook 360 stream, it had 2.4 million views, um, which was the most views of anything on Facebook 360. For the first time ever, the 360 stream beat the 2D stream. More people watched 360 than watched the accompanying 2D stream. And the, for metrics, uh, the average amount of, at any one, it was a two hours and 18 minutes broadcast. At any point in the broadcast, if you tuned in, there were an average of 10 to 12,000 people concurrently watching. And the average viewer stayed in and watched for about five minutes. And for digital video stats, anybody staying and watching anything for five minutes is, is unheard of. And to me, that just, that just speaks to this. That speaks to when you give people compelling content to look at, it, it matters, and they stay in it. And it's also, for advertisers, there was, there was some, a little bit of product placement in there, and there was a little bit of advertising. For advertisers, they may not realize it yet, but immersion in VR is their, is their dream come true. Because when you show people an ad in VR, it's 100% completion and 100% views, because they're not looking at anything else. They are, they, they're not looking at their phone, they're not looking at their TV, they're looking at your ad, they're seeing it all the way through and then they move on. And it takes a tremendous amount of user agency to actually take off the headset and say, I'm not gonna watch this anymore. It's like going into a movie theater and deciding you're gonna get up and walk out, which I can do, my, my wife can't, it's, it's a problem. Um, so, and the last thing is, you know, I'm curious, 
Does anybody know what the, I'm sure most of the people in here do, but what's the biggest AR company in the world? Snapchat. This is my 17-year-old daughter teaching me how to use Snapchat, by the way. Um, Snapchat is, and this is a little bit of, a, of, a, of an aside, but how many of you have a, Snap, a Snapchat account? Well, how many of you have teenage kids, first of all? <laughs> you know? And if, for those of you that don't have a Snapchat account, I highly recommend you get one and start playing with it. Not necessarily to become an active Snapchatter, but just to familiarize, with, familiarize yourself with what the company is doing. My 17-year-old daughter and my 13-year-old son, not so much him, but my 17-year-old daughter and her friends, every day they create these snap stories, which are sort of a rolling 24-hour editorial cycle of what you've done in the past 24 hours. She calls it a snap story. I call it editing because she's, uh, she's collecting raw material, she's putting it into a bin, she's assigning in and out points and putting it on a timeline to create a compelling narrative arc. That's an edit. She's editing every day. And she's editing in AR every day because she's creating these edits and putting, and putting different points of data in a compelling way across these different video clips. And she has the, the spectacles now, um, so she's doing it in several different ways. And it will take, I think, and I have no actual proof of this, it's a very small switch for Snapchat to flip for them to go, we are now a tools company. And overnight, they become the biggest editing platform in the world. In the US, um, in the demographic from 18 to 25 years old, 48% of people 18 to 25 years old in the US open Snapchat at least once a day and use it. So it's by far the social network with the biggest penetration in the demographic that everybody wants. And they're doing amazing stuff. Um, they're doing bespoke advertising now, which is they have a big AR team, you know, right across the street. They have a big AR team. If you take a picture of something, if you take a picture of, bar, of a bar, it can rec Snapchat can recognize that that's a bar counter and put a bottle of Bud on it. Take a picture of a house, they can recognize that's a driveway and put a Ford truck in the driveway. They're doing bespoke advertising in AR at a level that is way beyond what anybody else is even thinking about. So this is, the, a comp this is probably the company that I watch the closest in terms of future trends in the industry at a mass scale for the demographic that's going to be using these tools and for, for whom it matters the most. So anyway, that is, and I sort of end with, um, it comes back to me to the quest for the, the quest for reality. That's Jean-Baptiste Alphonse Lacar, who was the first person that said, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Thanks very much.